Okay. Thank you guys for coming. Um, so, for those of you who are in the class, the whole theme this year of uh, Dr. Luper's class is the hero's journey, Joseph Campbell. So, I felt it was appropriate for this quote to be used as we open up for Dean's. The dark night of the soul comes just before revelation. When everything is lost and all seems darkness, then comes the new life and all that is needed. I'm going to try to do this without crying this time, so. All right. Campbell had a hypothesis about stories. Not just their structure, but that they are humanity's attempts to understand itself. Through characters, environments, struggles, triumphs, and ultimately the acceptance of our fears. Bill Finger and Bob Kane created the character that was part man and part horned creature. A horned creature of the night. And this creature, <clears throat> for all of its demonic associations, became a beacon of hope for the innocent and a symbol of fear for the cowardly, superstitious lot of his world. This character, shrouded in darkness, watches over, but watches ever vigilant over his people. He was a story once, but now he is legend. A legend that we, not, that we tell not to remind ourselves that there is evil in this world, but that we have the strength, the power, to overcome it. And that power, that strength, is yours. You are back. But if you're wondering what to do with your cake and cow, what it means to be that hero, you're in the right place, because he's here. He's the first Batman I ever knew. And I'm proud of him for being that hero. His name is Dean Tripp. And he's here to teach you about something terrible. But also about something greater than terror. He's here to teach you about you. So please join me in welcoming our dark night. Dean Tripp.
could save you from something terrible. You know, I'm not really supposed to let people from your earth know where I'll live. Then I figured the ancient party knows I'm there. You'll be safe. Child sexual abuse, offenders, causal factors. The experience of sexual abuse as a child was previously thought to be a strong risk factor, but the research does not show a causal relationship, as the vast majority of sexually abused children do not grow up to be adult offenders, nor do the majority of adult offenders report childhood sexual abuse. No less. <coughs> and then, uh, just to get us all on the same page, I'm going to go ahead and read you the afterword that I wrote. As you notice, there's very few words in the comic. Uh, I pushed all that into the afterwards so that I could let your thoughts be the thoughts you're thinking when you're looking at the panels. But to tell you my story. Well, they say to make art for yourself. I started writing something terrible a little over a year ago after a conversation with my friend Ben, in which I offered my own secret origin to explain my dislike of crazy or broken depictions of Batman. I feel like Bruce Wayne would have gone crazy if he hadn't become he needed an outlet for his pain. He had only a child's solution to an unsolvable problem. He became a superhero. In 1986, my world was broken by two criminals, my biological father who abandoned his family like his father had, and a teenager who threatened me with a gun and raped me for three days. Luckily for me and his six other victims, my incredible mom figured out what happened and made sure he was prosecuted. After the police, the confession, the psychologists, and me, Assured that my attacker couldn't follow through on his threats, I was sent back to school. I was in the darkness alone for years, until the last week of fifth grade, when the teachers let us watch the 1989 Batman movie. I'd like Batman as much as the next kid watching Super Friends and the Adam West show whenever I could, but I'd never seen his origin story. When Bat Michael Keaton flashed back to his childhood trauma, it struck a chord in me that I didn't fully understand at the time. But I think it was the simple message of all good superhero stories you are who you choose to be. It's not what happens to you that makes you who you are, but what you choose to do with it. I bought my first Batman comic a few weeks later. It's hard to overstate the effect that classroom movie day had on my life. As I grew older, always interested in criminal justice, I watched a ton of cop shows. I was especially interested in any episodes dealing with child molesters. I was horrified to hear over and over again that they were apparently just former victims inflicting their the crimes of their own attackers upon newer, younger innocents. Like my father had when he carried on the family tradition of leaving your son when he survived. I swore to take my own life if I ever had sexual thoughts about children. My own history had made me someone who must protect children, even if that meant for myself. It's horrible, living in fear that there's something terrible inside you, like you might be some secret monster, requiring constant visual vigilance lest the beast be unleashed. In the 90s, the misconception of the cycle of violence had infected public consciousness. Almost every police procedural I've ever seen deal with the subject, to this day, has perpetuated it. I struggled with my sexuality, at one time believing the idiots who say that being molested somehow makes you gay. On that subject, I want to say that I have never been bullied or made to feel unsafe by my gay friends, unlike straight ones. I lived my entire life wanting to be a father, to break the chain of abandonment in my family tree, but also fear of having a son in case I was hopelessly corrupted by my childhood experiences. I prayed for a daughter. Having two awesome sisters predisposed me to thinking that would be better. I ended up having the best and brightest son in the world, but I avoided changing diapers or helping with bath time. His mother knew about my history, but I don't think my precautions helped our already doomed relationship. I drew the first version of the rescue scene in the story a few years ago, after getting over the fear that I might actually rewrite time by inviting heroes of other universes into ours. Look, I don't mess with time travel. My son's the best thing that ever happened to me, and I wouldn't change a second of my life to not have him here. But the day I drew the first pencil sketch of Batman putting his arm around six-year-old me, I was changed. Of course he came to save me. Superheroes don't let bad things happen to kids. That night I was reading about child sexual abuse on Wikipedia and was stunned to discover that not only did most victims not become offenders, of course not, the stats are too horrifyingly high for that to be true, but most offenders weren't even victims. I was set free. 
I was finally able to put down the invisible gun I'd kept aimed at my head since I was a child. If you're an adult survivor of child sexual abuse, I made this comment just to let you know that there's not something terrible lurking inside you. Over the last few years, I found out a lot of things I didn't know about the two crimes that defined my life. I found out my biological father was alive with a history of abandoning family, families, spending years in and out of jail. I found out my rapist name, and that he's currently incarcerated for driving drunk the wrong way down the median road with a kid in the car. I guess it's pretty ideal that he's behind bars. I also learned that my mom had started dating my new dad when this happened, and that it was all she could do to keep him from killing the guy. My mom's name is Sarah Tripp, and she is the strongest person I've ever met. My adopted dad, Charlton Tripp, has always had my back and believed in me. The real heroes of my life are my parents. Batman was a good substitute for a kid to understand. I was in the darkness. The story of Batman helped me realize that I could wrap it around my arms like a security blanket or a cape. The yellow symbol on my chest was my light, defended by a black creature more powerful than anything crime could throw at me. A creature of the night, something terrible, a bat. And eventually, I brought Batman to our world in a comic, and somehow it really did change my story. Thanks for reading with me. I'm back up to my favorite page. Hey everybody, I'm Dean. Um, I've been working professionally in comics for over a decade. This is the most widely read comic I've ever worked on. It's actually the most widely read comic of the year, as far as I can estimate. Like a million and a half people read it in November, which is more than the top 10 comics that month put together. And it was a big month, too, Walking Dead had very good covers. <laughs> as you can see, I kind of patterned my life on Batman. And by kind of, I mean absolutely. I take Batman pretty seriously. I also take it pretty silly. Silly more? Let's say it. <laughs> I, uh, I love Batman. I love the idea that you are who you choose to be, that message of all the superhero stories. There's special things about it. A lot of people have written me. I used to write people who would come out about their childhood sexual abuse experiences because you feel so alone when you're a victim of this, and it's a crime that stays with you. It's something that you'll always be reminded of. It separates you in a way, but you feel so alone even though the stats are so high because no one talks about it. I didn't talk about it. I'm 33, and this happened to me when I was six years old. Decades spent in fear of myself, in fear of people finding out because of the misconceptions about victims of child abuse. I was afraid people would be scared of having around their kids. Scared of having kids, desperate to have kids. Scared of having kids, desperate to have kids. It's a big year for me. Uh, being 33, growing up in church, uh, I think you uh, put a lot of emphasis on Jesus here, right? Lived at 33 through something special. It just so happens that I was able to turn the worst thing that ever happened to me into something that's helping others. Um, I'm now the person who receives the messages rather than sends them um, from victims all over the world. It's also the year that I passed my lifelong goal of not leaving my son when he's five. Feels really good. I got another year or so far I'm out of there. My son's so great. You guys would love him. I wish you could come with me today, but he's in school. Uh, he spends his weekends with his mom. He's with me during the week. He's like me without the pain. Just the joy. Loves superheroes. Spider Man's his favorite, huh? But he's <laughs> such a good dude. I don't know if you guys know in the comics, uh, there's a new Spider Man. Uh, they introduced. Uh, do you remember Donald Glover wanted to play Spider Man? Do you ever hear about that? And they're like, people got all along, like, black dude can't play Spider Man. Spider Man's white. It's like, yeah, he's also a fictional dude. Um, <laughs> the writer of Spider Man, Brian Michael Bendis, uh, was like, what if we had a black Spider-Man? So they have one now. His name's Miles Morales. And he's like a 14-year-old kid uh, going to a charter school in New York. He's got different powers. He got bitten by a different kind of spider. Uh, my son is the first person to ever have a Miles Morales Spider-Man costume. It's black with red web lines. It looks awesome. He saw that costume. He was like, that's what I want to be for Halloween. So me and my mom made it for him. Uh, he was that for two Halloweens. This year, though, he wanted to be Robin. He's like, I'll be Robin. You can be Batman. <laughs> 
I don't know if you guys can imagine, I have to keep my emotions in check. You can't change the minds. You're like, yeah, we, well, yeah, if you want to. And I spent a month working on this costume. <laughs> Upgraded mine. I had to wear two layers of Spanx. <laughs> Not that. <bad. laughs> I love dressing up in the cape. I don't know if you've noticed, but women's fashion has moved in this really great direction where everybody's half cosplaying Batgirl, tights and boots. I think if we had too many belts and capes to that, we'd be on the right track. So I'm a big fan of superheroes. I like the costuming, I like the idea of helping people. There's no, if you guys haven't been a superhero for Halloween, can I just recommend it? The feeling of a cape in the wind behind your back. Growing up in church, do you know that song, like, uh, we will soar on wings like eagles? Uh, I didn't, I think of that. When I would sing that song, I would think of the sound of a cape behind me. I don't know if there's an afterlife. If there is, I want there to be caves. <laughs> I, uh, I literally built my life around that. Like the idea that you can build yourself, you can train yourself. I used to tell people that, and it sounded silly, and it still does. But now I've done this work that kind of explains what I've been about. I wanted to build myself into being the best dad you could possibly be. I work with kids ages 2 to 20. I, of course, have that gun in my head in case my thoughts ever stray from just being the kind of Nightwing Big Brother character. Um, but I've always been good with kids, and I think it's because I have a good memory. Um, my earliest memory is before I was two. When I talk to kids, it's a lot like when I'm talking to you guys. Um, I try to explain things simply. I try to think of what level I could understand when I was five when I talked to my son. I happen to have a son because of explaining things well, he now knows how to do square roots. Add, multiply, divide, and read before he was in kindergarten. I know I'm lucky, he's a sharp dude, he's super funny and fun, really well behaved. He's very chill, he used to play Legos and video games. I'm really serious about Cosmos right now. But, um, see, so yeah, I built myself into being a dad, and I'm really good at it. It's really rewarding. If you don't have kids, get them. That's what I say. Um, <laughs> so I worked with kids my whole life. I never liked that trope in movies. And dads are like, I don't know how to hold babies. It's like it's a baby. It's a little bit. Um, but I've been through a lot. Um, I got divorced a couple of years ago. I have my son with me. This year, just before this book came out, I started dating this woman named Candace. And we met on OkCupid, okay which I have more recommendations yet. Um, do you guys know Cerebro from X-Men? It's that machine that they use to find other mutants, that big map. OkCupid's okay like that for finding liberals in the South. <laughs> vital for me. Uh, we've been dating almost a year. She's really great. She's got two kids for her own one. I spent my entire life trying not to be my father, and now I get to kind of be my stepfather. I found a woman with boy and a girl about the age that we were. And, uh, as you might imagine, uh, when your mom starts dating a guy in girls' comics, it's pretty cool. <laughs> but my life has taken this big turn this year, and it, it's kind of like everything lined up. It's, it's really weird. Um, you know, that It Gets Better campaign, I'm a big fan of that. Because it does. Some of it is just that life gets better. You don't have like high school, you know, college, you guys are in college. College is better than high school. And uh, being out of college is better than college, except for you don't have some of the money you have being in college. <laughs> but uh, less rules, less people telling you, you know, what you have to do. Those rules are in place for a reason. But when you're a kid, like, a lot of times people don't tell you the reasons. Like, because I said so, because that's the way it is, and this is the best time of your life, and all that nonsense. But, one of the reasons things get better is because you can choose to live your life by your code. Um, I'm kind of pathologically honest, and uh, my code is I will help people. I'm going to be who I am regardless of what anyone does to me. Even if somebody's dirt to me, I really am not very vengeful because I don't know what's going on in their life. Nobody knew what was going on in mine. The guy who most hurt me professionally, is, I'm not going to go into detail, but uh, his mom had died, and he was going through a lot. I still think he's a jerk, but you know, 
dude's going through a lot. I can't really judge it. I don't have any vindictive feelings. This story about building yourself is one aspect of my life. There's been a lot more stuff. But this has been a darkness, a cloud that defined me. I was trying to be the funny kid. I was trying to be the smart kid. I did not try to be the good student. If I had to do over again, man, I would kick butt at school. Just because I treat it like a game win. This thing about people becoming victims, becoming offenders, is such a huge misconception. It's one of those things you hear it anecdotally. It's often in shows. Writers, we have the ability to spread information. And one of the problems with that is if you have bad information, you're spreading bad information. The, not all sharks have to keep swimming or they'll die. Uh, the Inuit do not have more than 100 words for snow. They use compound words, adjectives, you know. Um, things like that get used in uh, speeches and sermons and spread and the misinformation grows and it takes a long time for it to filter back out. Growing up with this police procedural thing, like I'm such a huge fan of cop shows. Like I love cop shows, I'm scared of cops. Um, my first cop show, the greatest one everybody knows, Andy Griffin. <laughs> Dude was on the street, dealing with things like Otis. <laughs> My favorite one is The Wire, and then there's, before that was Homicide. That's the, the panel you see, the show I'm watching. I, it's a fictionalized composite of multiple shows I watch, but I chose to use Frank Pimbleton and Tim Bayless, my favorite detectives on uh, Homicide Life on the Street. Uh, Frank Pimbleton there is actually Andre Brower, and he, he's on Brooklyn Nine-Nine now, another great cop show. And it's so cool for him to be a cop again, because I love Frank Pimbleton. So I decided he's chilled out, and now he's got this cool squad. But this thing spread. I was watching an episode of The Mentalist just a couple of weeks ago, and they did the same thing, where a victim of child abuse and his sister of both victims became like these horrible serial kidnappers who would uh, torture and murder people. That's not what happens. Because this crime is so terrible, we want there to be an explanation. We want it so badly because we can't wrap our heads around it. Why would someone hurt a child in this way? It's so criminal. I love Batman because he hates criminals. But it's so criminal and we need there to be an explanation because we can't wrap our heads around someone who would do something so terrible. But it's not that they were victims. There was an episode of Medium where it was just you know, she talked to ghosts, and it was, uh, there was a, a molester they had caught, and then she could see the dead uh, attacker that he had, and the person who victimized him, and the person who victimized him, this ghost chain of cycle of violence, and it's not true. But because of that misconception, people are scared to open up about their own experiences. That fear keeps us from feeling like there are more people who know what we're talking about. That is so criminal to do that to people. Um, I'm really happy I've had the chance to tell this story. You know, it's really rare in life for things to align so that, you know, Superman always says, like, this looks like a job for Superman. Um, <laughs> in real life, you don't really see things that clearly usually. But working on this, it was funny, I, I was talking to my friend Ben, like I said in the afterward, uh, my friend Ben Ackery writes the Thrilling Adventure Hour podcast, which I recommend so wholeheartedly, it's so fun. Um, Paula Tompkins and Nathan Fillion, podcast and Jackson. But um, he's a great friend of mine, and we were just talking about Batman. I really don't like when they portray Batman as crazy or, or vengeance driven. Some people don't like the idea that Batman's uh, parents' killers were caught because they think he's out for revenge. It's always driven to go catch that guy. It's not what it's about. Crime took his parents and was trying to prevent anyone else from having to experience that. But with that idea of Batman, it's so simple. He needed something he didn't have, so he became that for others. I know this sounds kind of self-aggrandizing, but that's really what I tried to do with this story. I was telling Ben about it, and he said, about what happened to me, and he said, you've got to make that into a comic. I'm not 
that thing that I trained to do my whole life and have been doing professionally for years, that's silly. I was planning on a blog post whenever like uh, public figures have come out about their experiences. It's meant a lot to me. Uh, probably written letters. Uh, like I said, um, now I get it. For so many people, it's bad. People write me and it's, some of them it's like, you know, it was Lord of the Rings, or Star Trek, or Star Wars, Green Lantern. <coughs> But for a lot of it, it's Batman, and it makes sense. It's a childhood trauma story. Batman experienced the same kind of thing where someone, for no reason, takes something from him. This horrible thing. One of the worst things you can imagine. To be honest, I feel like I kind of got to be. Of course, I say that having my parents really saved my life. But again, people don't talk about it. And this is a job for me. It's weird for the thing that you're most afraid of people fighting out to become the thing you're most known for. But it's a good job. It's a hard job, and it's my job. It's a job for the intro. I spend a lot of time talking about this book now. It's really funny because it's so short, kind of self-explanatory. It's 14 pages long. But the reason I get to talk about it a lot is because it's about the power of fictional heroes. In real life, we have heroes. A lot of times, people don't want to know the truth about them. People don't want to know if Martin Luther King did a bad thing, or they don't want to know if which presidents were gay, and they don't want to know that you know Jesus didn't speak English, guys. Um, they don't want to know these things that derail their preconceptions and their childhood versions of, of understanding. Because the real world is complex. It's not black and white. It's not four colors either. It is complicated. The thing about those things is they can lead to real fights, people arguing because they're real issues. If you base your beliefs on the, the teachings of Joseph Smith and that encourages you to disassociate from this group or these people, or whatever it is, that's a real thing and a real person and you gotta really argue over it. There will be no wars over Batman or Superman. Even though we have told more stories about them than any other characters in history. It sounds crazy, doesn't it? There have been more stories told about Batman and Superman than any other characters in fiction ever in human history. There aren't more Dracula stories. There aren't more Hercules stories. There are more Batman stories. It's spread all over the world in every medium. I was in Uganda working with this orphanage, and an 85-year-old pastor named Tom told me I loved the Batman. He would always win, right? It's a pretty good superpower. It's always winning. You know how you always win is you play by your rules. You play your game. That's what I've tried to do with my life. <laughs> it's so funny talking about this because it's like, you guys just learn to be cool like me. <laughs> but really, I'm driven by the idea that you can help people with your abilities. Superheroes, you use all your abilities to help everyone you can. That's not, you've got to go be Batman or you've got to go learn to do things you don't have an aptitude for. It's your abilities. You guys all have talents that you were born with and you were trained to do and you know how to do that others don't. No one has the same skill set. Batman's kind of good there. But using all of your abilities to help everyone, you can. It's not you've got to save the world. You've got to change the way everything functions. You've got to change the course of human history. It's just there's a group of people around you that you have influence over and you are powerful. We talk about Superman. A lot of people say he's unrelatable because he's this godlike being from another planet with limitless powers. I think it's really cool. He's the first superpower or superhero. He's this ideal being that we can't ever be. Second superhero is Batman, who's an option. Every day you choose not to be him. It's something you can train to be. I think I would need more money. <laughs> and I'd have to exercise, which sounds. But <laughs> Superman, the ideal being to strive for, it seems unrelatable, people say, and a lot of times people prefer Batman because he's a good guy, and that's one of the reasons why I like him. Because he didn't he doesn't have the normal superhero origin story where he receives powers and then goes to, has to choose. Which by the way is the same thing for every supervillain. To get superpowers in some freak accident and then 
You either use them selfishly or selflessly. That's it. Your life in a comic book world is selfish or selfless. And that's the heroes and villains of every story. Superman is an unrelatable character, some people say. But I really feel like we all end up on this planet with more power than we realize, maybe more than we should have over the lives of others around us. The influence, the power of being kind and being helpful. I always feel like my superpower is that I'm always where I'm supposed to be. It's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy if you really try to be useful wherever you are, but I always felt like if I could make a deal where I was always where I was most needed, I would do that. And I kind of feel like that's been my life. It's been so weird to just happen into a place where I end up being the guy who's able to help someone else. I'm sure that would happen if I ended up in another place. It feels that way. It feels like I'm always where I'm supposed to be. But your influence over others will extend past your death. With every kind word, every selfish crime, we are changing the future of all of mankind. That is so true, right? You think about Bill Finger, who Mike mentioned. He's the co-creator of Batman. He's uncredited. The creator, co-creator of Batman that is credited, Bob Kane, has this incredible incredibly fancy headstone to his grave that says, Batman was a hand of God creation inspired by the Lord and sent to Bob Kane who created him from nothing and you know, it's a series of justice. There's a lie. Uh, Bill Finger created the Batman. You know. Bob Kane was his boss. He was the writer. You know Batman's origin story? It was Bill Finger. His cape, his cow, Commissioner Gordon, Gotham City, Robin, and Joker. He wrote more Batman stories than anybody for decades. He even wrote an episode of the 66 show that is the one I remembered most in my life. So I, when I found out that he wrote it, it felt touching to me. This was the Clock King. Dude gets to write an episode of the Batman TV show, a character he co-created that's now so, super huge culturally. He gets to write an episode of it. Does he write Catwoman, the Joker, Penguin characters he created? No, he makes a new character, the Clock King. That's a good one. Get a gig. Make up some new stuff. Bill Finger was cremated in front of the ocean. He died poor and alone in an apartment, estranged from his family. And I know that his choices may have led him there, but also the choices of others, people who took advantage of him. I feel so indebted to this person with no grave who wrote a story about a boy making a candlelight vow to become the world's greatest crime fighter. Because the idea that you could choose when you're a kid who you're going to be when you're a grown up changed my life, saved me. The guy died before I was even born and saved my life. You have that power as a writer. Comics and, and, uh, and fiction and true stories, they all. If you're a writer or an artist, your works live past you, and they live outside of you. This story, it's weird, you know, because it's my life, right? It is a condensed, edited, selected version of my life in order to tell this story and try and make it impactful and useful for other people. Because really, the point of doing it was to let people know that they're not secretly monsters if they were victims. But it's separate from me people put themselves into it. You know, when you learn to draw, a lot of people are concerned about their style. They're trying to figure out their style. And style is a collection of your mistakes, things you're incapable of, and your choices, which are also kind of mistakes. You're choosing to draw in a way that's not hyper-realistic. You're choosing to see your blind stylize. But it's a combination of those two things that makes your style. I was trained to do traditional portraits, hyper-realistic pencil portraits. But in storytelling, I try to limit the way I draw down to the simplest thing ever, because instead of showing off how well I can draw by drawing simply, you put yourself into the place of the, of the main characters. That's why the smiley face was such a successful symbol in the 20th century. 
in writing and in drawing comics, you are completely in charge of what you show and what you say. And the more you can limit that down to the essential, the less you waste the reader's time, the better your work is. Has anybody in here read Elements of Style? Got two, two, two. Uh, you should read that book if you want to write stuff. I didn't read it until I was in my 20s. I was working at a bookstore. Uh, but it's like five or 10 bucks, and it'll take you a day to read it. Change the way you think about words. Uh, it is a really good book on writing. It's the only one I ever recommend my friends say a lot. Because everything else is trying to understand structure. There's so much value in that, but kind of every story you've ever heard has taught you a context for how stories work. And what you need in composition is understanding how to limit yourself down from showing off. I think it's really vital. Also, one of the things I learned in working on this story is that if you <laughs> tell the stories that matter the most to you, you get your best work. This isn't just the most important story I've worked on or the most valuable or most widely read one. It's the best one, man. Not for nothing, but I drew the hell out of this. It's because I, my give a damn factor was so high. <laughs> it had to be as good as I could make it. I think that should be my goal going forward. This panel up here is so simple. It's just me walking in the woods, which I did a lot growing up in farm country. But when you're in charge of how to show things and what to show, you can control all the elements. You know, I was a fan of bats even before I liked Batman. My mom recently showed me a picture when I was like three or four of me at Halloween dressed as a bat, not Batman. I was like that, so I was telling this good omens. So there, I've got seeing bats in the woods, super normal thing. But in terms of storytelling, 